Search green. Twenty one. Slide show again. All right. No. Spiral Keats should be familiar to everybody, even Preston. I'm gonna, just going to say Preston already knows about Spiral Keats because he took, you're taking intro micro, so you talk about Spiral Keats. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about uh, detecting Spiral Keats, and we have two really big. Um, Big ones. One's kind of playing playing out. Sorry. One's playing out, which is syphilis. It's still around, and we're going to talk about the numbers and where the cases, new cases, are with syphilis. Um, but it's not like it used to be. Uh, so it's not like, oh my gosh, somebody has syphilis. Um, to the point where we used to check our clinical students in phlebotomy for syphilis before, before they would go because they were contacting the patient. So everybody that had like hands-on contact with a patient should be screened for syphilis was, was the scenario that we, we started with with clinical. And then that kind of died down where they just said basically it just disappeared where we didn't have to require clinical students to be tested for syphilis. Uh, before they went out. So uh, you used to have to send all the students to the health department and get a syphilis test, RPR, which we're going to do today, this afternoon. And you would always get an HIV screen at the, all at the same time for free. If you went to the health department and asked for that, they'd give those two tests to you for free. Uh, so spiral key illnesses, we, we know those. Um, one of those causes syphilis, and we'll talk about the first one. The second one, which seems to be climbing, um, is Lyme disease. So that's the other one that's caused by spiral keep bacteria. And we'll talk a little bit about Lyme disease and the, and the major factors in diagnosing that. And then the last one is kind of like the end of the chapter. We talk about relapsing fever group. And it's not that we want to talk a lot about relapsing fever, but we want to talk about is there other organisms that may be not being identified as Lyme, but have kind of the same effect on the patient? So that's, we have another Borrelia at the end to talk about. So that's kind of the chapter, it's not very long. Um, and then this afternoon, when we come to lab, we have a uh, RPR, which we'll be doing. And then as I was digging through the refrigerator yesterday, I came across an immunological assay for Lyme disease. So we're going to bring it out and see what it looks like and re and have two tests this afternoon since those are our two topics that we're going to talk about this morning. So they're both serum tests. They're both looking uh, for antibodies. So it's one of those days. So it shouldn't be too bad in lab today, but it should be um, some you know fun with the test. And RPR is one that we may have to do in-house some, but not very often anymore. So let's look at, so we're gonna talk about syphilis. If you didn't know that's where we're headed. Talk about Lyme disease and relapsing fever at the end. So syphilis, a sexually transmitted, okay? So it is, I love the first numbers. This is where I wanted to talk about. Always like up-to-date books because textbooks, is they always give you up-to-date numbers. So they talk about uh, syphilis is the most commonly acquired spiral keep disease in the United States. So that's why it's the number one when we hit spiral keeps. It's typically spread through sexual transmission, although the incidence of syphilis in the U.S. reached an all-time low, okay, 2.2 cases per 100,000 individuals, and this was in 20 years ago, so 2000. So it hit an all-time low in 2000. It has slowly been coming back. So the cases have been increasing since 2000, up to 6.3 cases per 100,000 people in 2014. So you can imagine if the brand new numbers, we had those for 2020. Uh, the reason, homosexual transmission. Homosexual transmission between men was responsible for much of the increase in those 14 years, 
In fact, 2000, this group accounted for only 6% of all the syphilis cases in the United States. 2005, it was 60% of all the syphilis cases in the, that's a huge jump, right? So you go from 6% in, in 2000, five years later, it's over half of the cases up to 2012, where it's 80% of the cases. So you can, if we were keeping that number going, it, it may be in the 90s by now. 90%. So I don't have a 2020 number and sorry about that, but that is going to be your key demographic to say, okay, we have those numbers. And as we'd like to say, numbers don't lie. So if we've jumped from 6% to 80% in the last 14 years or the last few years from here, um, that's probably going to be your cases. Okay. So the good thing about syphilis is that we can rapidly detect it, okay? So we can do a quick rapid test and then we can treat it, okay? The biggest problem with syphilis, what we're gonna be talking about more and more, and I think we hinted at it in, in pathogenic micro, clinical micro, was the untreated case, okay? So a lot of the things we're gonna talk about, if it was treated, goes away, okay? Things stop. So, the progression that we're going to talk about with syphilis, a lot of that is based on whether the patient got treated or not for it. So you can see that if you come in with the diagnosis early and get treatment started, then things usually work out. But it's the unknown case that they don't know they have it, that it goes past or has a percentage chance of going past each step into some major problems. So trepanema, trepanema pallidum is the official name of the bacteria, the spirochete. So this is a bacteria, even though it looks like a worm, even though it looks like a parasite, it is a bacteria. It's rapidly destroyed by heat, cold, or drying. So it's not one of those that, oh my gosh, you worked with syphilis on the countertop, thus I must really worry about picking it up. It's person to person transfer. Okay, so it's very hard to cultivate. It's very hard to, uh, it's easy to detect from that person if they have the sore or the canker, but it's very hard to take that and put it on a media to grow it out later to see a spiral key grow. Spiral keys are not readily cultivated. So you're not gonna get a sample from a body fluid like we did the other day and go, oh, they're syphilis. You know, we, we're not gonna be surprised with a growth of a spiral key. We're gonna to have to detect it in other ways. Uh, direct contact, we just talked about that. So the lesion can be on the male, the canker, okay? And then it can also be in the female. And if it's on the female, it's not readily seen, it's not readily detected, but it still can be contagious if there's skin to skin contact with the canker. There's also transmis transmission to a fetus if the mother is syphilis positive during pregnancy. And their bloodborne transmission is very rare because what do we do with blood now? What do you do? Where do you see blood in the hospitals? Anybody know? Anybody seen a refrigerator? Oh, refrigerator of blood, right? We refrigerate our blood supply. So as you say, it is sensitive to cold. So if you put blood in the refrigerator, chances of syphilis, re, you know, surviving that is, but they still test for it, just so you know. Okay, it still tests the patient, the blood donor for syphilis. Um, so there is the canker, okay? So this is just a primary stage. So it is a sore. Um, it's visible, especially on the male. And like we just said, it may not be visible on the female. Uh, during an exam, it would be, but just, hey, if I'm on a date, no. Um, then it can go to a secondary stage, and this is after the canker heals. It goes into a stage of more of a rash. So you get generalized lymphadenopathy, malaise, fever, sore throat, and a rash would be the secondary stage of syphilis. Then after secondary stage, it goes to a latent stage where the patient becomes asymptomatic. And then the last one is a tertiary stage. If it moves to that, we get the gumas form, and then you can have cardiovascular issues and neurosyphilis. Okay. So this is a progression. That's not every patient goes to this step. No, every patient's gonna make it out of the primary stage. Um, 
they may be cured in the primary stage before they go to the secondary stage. From secondary stage, they may be cured. So that's what we're talking about. If you can find these patients, the patient comes in and we diagnose them early, then we can get the treatment started. All right, so you have percentages, and I always like to do the percentages. Okay, so mode of transmission, approximately, your book says 30 to 50% of the individuals who are exposed to a sexual partner with an active lesion will require. But still, even if you had an active lesion on a sex partner, it's still 50-50 whether you're actually going to get syphilis from that. Okay, so that's good news. Then, so we go over the stage, this is where I want to be, 372. The stages, so we have the canker. How long is the canker going to be? The canker develops between 10 and 90 days after infection. So this is not going to be an immediate thing. And on average, it's about three weeks. So once exposed to syphilis from a sex partner, then you would actually develop the canker three weeks later. Okay, men usually occur outside on the penis. Women usually appear in the bad, a vagina on the cervix and thus goes undetected. So that's our problem, okay? And as I like to say, when men have something unusual, they usually go to the doctor and say, what is this? Okay, so if a, a guy develops a canker, they would probably seek treatment. Uh, the primary stage lasts one to six weeks, during which time the lesion heals spontaneously. So nothing has to happen for that lesion to go away, that canker to go away. So you can imagine if somebody says, hey, I got this thing, and then a few weeks later they go, that thing's gone. Hey, I'm good to go, right? So uh, at that step, about 25%. 25, so a quarter of those patients, if you get a primary lesion, okay, go into primary syphilis, only about a quarter of the patients who are untreated, okay, so again, if we got the canker and we treat the patient, we're good, all right? Untreated patient, still only a quarter will move into the secondary stage. So it's not like, oh, everybody has primary lesion, are gonna go to secondary. Get treated, you're not moving to secondary, okay? You go untreated, still only a fourth of a chance, one out of four to go to secondary. The secondary is where we start to see um, one to two months after the primary, 15% reported cases, the primary lesion may still be present, so still have the canker. And then we just went over the symptoms there with our generalized lymphadenopathy, malaise, fever, pharyngitis, and rash. The rash is the key. And you get this rash, it's not just, oh, on the sex areas, all right? This rash is on your feet, okay, and your hands, the palm of your hands. Why in those places? Not real sure. I'm not real sure why, but that's where we see it. So you would say, okay, now what? All right, I've got this rash on the inside of my hands, which would be unusual. Most times you think of a rash being out. But, oh my gosh, what did I get into? All right, and it's syphilis. So, yes. All right. Um, Involvement of the central nervous system may occur earlier than previously suspected. So we used to think neurosyphilis was one of those that we had to go through the latent stage where nothing's going on with the patient, which could be years down the road, and all of a sudden then neurosyphilis shows up. Okay, neurosyphilis again can show up earlier. 40% of the patients with secondary syphilis may exhibit neurological signs. So this lesion persists or the lesions persist up to a few days to eight weeks. Spontaneous, the healing occurs as in the primary stage. So then we go to latent. So what is latent stage? Latent stage is the disappearance of the rash characterized by a lack of clinical symptoms and it's divided into early and late latent and in which primary infection has occurred more than one year previously. So this is a years down the road. So this is a year away or even longer uh, when we go into the late. 
about one third of the individuals who remain untreated develop into tertiary. Okay, so that, so we do the numbers, right? We do the math, I know y'all love math. You don't get treated with the primary canker, one out of four chance you go to secondary, okay? Then secondary you go into latent. And then latent, only about 30% of the ones that ended up in late and latent phase go into tertiary phase. So you're only looking at 30% of the one quarter of all the patients that got syphilis to begin with, and that's still if untreated. So we're not gonna just, oh my gosh, person got syphilis, they're gonna go into latent. You know, they're gonna go into the tertiary. They're gonna end up with neurosyphilis before it's all said and done, right? So keep that in mind. 10 to 30 years following the secondary stage. That latent stage can go a long time before the patient all of a sudden starts to have real big bad issues. Manifestations are the GUMAs, okay, cardiovascular and neurosyphilis. And this GUMA is a localized, as it says, area of granulomatous inflammation often found on bones, skin, and subcutaneous tissue. During that 10 to 30 years, wouldn't there be some kind of like, like you go to the doctor for a checkup and they're like, oh, something's wrong here, and then they figure it out that way? Or? Well, in the latent stage, if you're asymptomatic, you would have to do a test, right? So what does it say about that? So that is key. Good question. What do they say about testing during the latent stage? Might have had it in micro. Did we talk about it in micro? I don't see it here. Is that what you're referring to? Could we still do a test mm -hmm. for the antibody at that point? Yes, serological test. Wouldn't have any reason to do a serological test. That's the problem. So it's not like something you can catch on something normal for a routine visit? I wouldn't think so. Yeah. No, because you're not showing any signs. The symptoms. You're, you're not going in for that. You don't have a rash. You don't have a canker. You don't have any, you know, no symptoms or asymptomatic during that stage. So this wouldn't be included, like, for females, like, during your annual pap smear, they wouldn't check for this? Or... They may do it OB, pre-OB. That would be the only reason to do it. Congenital, the next step. First thing is, it's really easy to treat, sorry. Effective treatment with a penicillin when detected in the early stage. I think I shared with you, my dad used to sell penicillin pills for a dollar. He might have done a lot for syphilis at the time. We still know, right? He might have been um, helping out there. Congenital syphilis, this is when the transmission occurs to the fetus, when a pregnant woman has early stage or latent syphilis. So yes, causes about 10% of the cases. Live born infants may be asymptomatic at birth, but then get the, the symptoms later. Runny nose, skin rash, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegalia, which is uh, enlarged liver and spleen, jaundice, anemia, bone abnormalities, and neurosyphilis, all on the infant, okay? So congenital spread. So this is why a, you would do a RPR as pre-OB, but not every pregnant female goes and gets pre-OB screened before they have their baby. I know that's hard to believe that there's no checkups the first time they may see the doctors when they're in labor, when they walk into your ER and say, I think I'm having a baby. That happens. That's just reality. So, and you don't know that until you work in an ER. Then here we come, right? And then in the lab, your, your push button is, we got to have some tests. Let's get some tests now. But it's the baby's born. I mean, it's not like, oh, we could treat mom. Would we run an antibiotic on mom? Probably, right? for group B strep would be one. That may be the same P 
penicillin-based antibiotic that would help us with syphilis, but it's too late. The baby has been infected at that time, by that time. So yes, definitely a problem with congenital syphilis. So, some great questions, some great info. Um, so how do we go about, well, you know, I hate to slide this, but you know, we missed one part. And I love, I'm going to have to go in and do some different slides. The nature of the immune response. Okay, so what happens? So this is what we, you know, this is, to me, this is the highlight of the chapter for us, right? You're the immunologist. You've learned all this. Primary body's defense against treponema invasion are intact skin and mucous membranes. Okay, so we have a, a barrier to the invasion. But once the skin is penetrated, then they've got the T cells and the macrophages play a key role. Primary lesion shows the presence of both. So the primary lesion, the canker that we see, has the presence of both T helper and C -tidus, cytotoxic cells, CD4s and 8s. Cytokines are produced that activate the macrophages, and this is what ultimately the macrophage phagocytizes that heals the primary canker. So that's me, that's a story you should be very familiar with. You should understand that description, but we kind of want to talk about it. Uh, the protective role of the antibodies is uncertain. However, coating the treponema, the coating, as coating the treponemas with antibody does not necessarily bring about their destruction. Palatum is also uh, capable of coating itself with host proteins, which delays the antibodies. Uh, the rare treponema proteins are known as TROMPs. I know that's close to somebody's name, but it would be too hard to remember that, right? TROMPs. Those are treponema. Um, what's rare treponema? Important at triggering the activation of complement, ultimately killing the organism. So if they're able to evade the immune response, then we're going to need antibiotic treatment. So your immune system can handle some, but can't handle all of it. Okay, so the antibiotics would be greatly appreciated this time. So what is the diagnosis? So we can directly take the, the canker, right, to demonstrate the actual spiral key there. We do that with dark field microscopy or fluorescent antibody stain couple of things we may not have available in our little hospital lab. We may have that available at AEL or Quest, which we should. Um, but those are a couple of things that I don't have in my lab. I don't have dark field microscopy. I don't have fluorescent antibody testing. But I could if I saw most of my people or my patients needed that. They needed to do a syphilis screen. We could do direct exam. So in, in lieu of that, we do serological testing. And this is where we spend a little time because we're going to talk about non-treponemal testing and treponemal testing. So we can do both, one or the other. So your book goes into non-treponemal is a screening. So if you screen non-treponemal, we're going to talk about what, how that works. Then we go to treponemal if we need to. So we have a little... Um, testing algorithms that we do to follow through with our testing. So the first thing we're going to talk about is detect antibody against this thing called reagent. And that's what you're going to do today. So reagent is a cardiolipin. Okay, so it is a lipid release from the membranes of cells damaged as a result of the infection. Okay, so we are going to detect antibodies against the reagent. So we're not detecting antibodies against treponema pallidum, against the spirochete itself. So this is an antibody kind of like the heterophil that we talked about, but this is definitely your body producing against something that was released due to the damage. So it's not a different species of some kind, right? We're talking about our own reagent, our own cardiolipin. So that's what we're looking for. This is a non-treponemal test. It was developed at Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. So it first got a name of VDRL. And we still see that. We can still perform that. 
but it's evolved into something as rapid plasma reagent test, and that's what we're going to do today called RPR. So you'll definitely need to know what RPR stands for and what it evolved from. It evolved from the VDRL test, but it is both of these are non treponemal tests. Okay. So we've got something called flocculation. It's kind of like a glutination, but it's flocculation. Okay, because we're going to use a couple of things, actually three things that make up cardiolipin. So we're going to go over here to, I think there's a list. Let me find my list of these little things. Tell you where they are. Okay, so here the antigen complex, this cardiolipin complex, consists of car not only cardiolipin, but a lectin and a cholesterol. So if we find this in the sera of the patients with syphilis, several other disease states, an antigen complex consisting of that cardiolipin, the reagent, is cardiolipin, cholesterol, and what was the last one? Lectin. Okay. So we've already heard about lectin in here, right? Where do we hear about lectin? Put your memory to the test today. I know. It's Wednesday. Where have we heard about lectin before? Binding. Mannose binding. Yeah, exactly. I knew you knew somebody knew that. Mannose binding lectin. Another way of it, what? Activating complement, right? That's where we've heard about lectin before. Good. Good job. All right, so this screen test is we take our patient serum, which we're going to do today, and we're going to put it onto a card, and we're going to add, right? We're going to add the cardiolipin. We're going to add the reagent. We have that. And it's attached with charcoal in our test kit. So the charcoal lets us view it if it starts to little, little flocculation, which is a little clumping. It's not like a glutination. It's not going to be like a bullet. But you're going to see some increasing in the size of the charcoal. The charcoal is going to kind of build on itself. So we'll have definitely the negative control and the positive control of the patient. And you kind of do the little thing again. I don't know if we need to build out again today, but we probably will. So we can get this little rotor going and, and do a little testing with our RPR. So it's very simple. I mean, it's like drop a serum, a drop of a reagent with, with charcoal attached, and then turn on and watch it work. So it's not going to be a very long test, a very quick test. Um, again, a fun one to do. And then we'll break out for Lyme disease and see how that one works. The VDRL. Patient serum is mixed on a slide, so this is a little more, you know, in, involved here with VDRL. Not much, um, but some of the things that we see with VDRL is that, like, you have to make the preparation um, a little different, but it's still kind of the same principle, okay? But it's just not as quick. It's not as rapid. Uh, viewed under a light microscope for flocculation, we don't have to go under a light microscope. We'll be able to see it with the, with the RPR, we'll be able to see it macroscopically. And reactive is going to be medium to large clumping, weakly reactive small, and non-reactive no clumps. So a weakly reactive would be what it would be, kind of a positive, and this is a real positive, but it's not negative. The RPR we're going to mix on a card with charcoal particles coated with cardiolipin antigen, rotate for eight minutes at 100 RPM, and observe macroscopic flocculation. So this is the evolving of the VDRL test. So this is what your test card is going to look like. So you're going to have a patient here undiluted. We can dilute the patient, but we don't know if a patient's even positive yet. So it's really doesn't call for dilution until we know the patient's positive. But this patient is reactive. 
see those large clumps. This is weekly. And the reason I can judge when we get down to lab today, what you can judge the negative, the non-reactive is, is I always like to say it's like a comet. It's like a comet tail that keeps swirling into the circle. So you're gonna see this long charcoal tail that doesn't need, doesn't, it stays intact. So anytime that tail starts to disappear, like in the weak reactive, you can see small clumping happening and there's no tail here. It's all clumped up in the reactive case. So that's what we'll be doing today in lab. So that's real, a good, um, good resource for your testing results. Do we do it powder with this one? No, no, because I don't expect any, whoever we draw, I don't expect to see a positive. I mean, we could play, we could probably go play with a control and go get one. But this, for us, it's a screening test. What's that? Would you count it, if you did do a counter, would you count it as a lot reactive being the last one? Yes. Yeah. You were saying, where would you call it? Where would you call it? One to eight here. I mean, I, is that light reactive still? Looks a little reactive to me, but. Yeah, it would be the last step of where it quit being positive. So you would call it to its positive. So it's just like a serial dilution. The last <laughs> tube that is positive is the, the value, the, is the um, titer. So you would say the titer is, you want to go one to eight, I guess. If we see that, if it looks like the tail there at one to 16, I think that's what it's showing. So one to eight would be the titer. And then you associate that with a level. Of antibody. Okay, so usually the kit comes with a little guide that'll say, hey, if you get a one to eight dilution, you have this amount of antibody present. So they do the core, they do the uh, the reference range for you basically. On the other hand, we can do treponemal tests. So again, our algorithm says if we screen the patient for RPR and they're reactive, then we have to confirm it with treponemal testing. So we have to go detect the antibody that is specific to the actual spiral key. So there'll be an antibody in the serum too, not just to the reagent or the reagent antibody, to the antigen uh, that's produced with cardiolipin, destruction of the cell. But this would be the actual spiral key. There would be an antibody detected for it. So you can do that two ways. We call it FTA absorption, which is fluorescent treponemal absorption. And then we can actually do particle agglutination. So the one that we have done in the past is the FTA absorption. But if we didn't have a fluorescent microscope to see, we'd use the particle agglutination. And then we can always do just like what we've done in the past with enzyme linked immunoabsorbent absorbent assay, ELISA testing to see the antibody, uh, chemiluminescent immunoassays, and that's not CLIA, that's not the CLIA 9089 uh, 88 uh, CLIA inspection, that's <laughs> chemiluminescent immunoassay. Don't get those confused, I hate when we use the acronyms that are exactly the same for something else. Multiplex flow immunoassays is our last step for automated. Uh, but, but the big thing is is to know that we can not only do a screen, but we have to move on to actually confirming it with treponemal tests. So the FTA, uh, the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test is an indirect immunofluorescent test. So what does that mean? When you hear indirect, what does that mean? to you. We have direct and indirect, right? I think we've harped on this enough in here. This. So, is Zoom, do you have any, have we lost some Zoom people? Did I, did I lose some? So I thought we had more. Uh, Zoom. I'm going to put the arrow on the, the key and y'all can tell me what you see. Y'all see the arrow? Why is that indirect? Nobody? Anybody in the classroom know? 
anytime we use anti-human IgG to test, to detect, what are we doing? We got the antigen, right? We got the spiral key antigen. We put the patient serum in there, right? We don't know if it's there or not, but if it was there, it would attach to the antigen, right? And then we put something in indirectly to what? Attached to the antibody that was either there or not there. And if it's not there, then that doesn't light up and it doesn't react. Remember that? Indirectly, not attached directly. Okay. Don't make it harder than it has to be. That's what I'm keep trying to make you do. For a blood banker, you're going to need to stay simple. All right. So that's the key to indirect testing. Here is the uh, trepidemal pallidum. What's PA stand for again? PA, PA? Particle agglutination. Particle agglutination, right? Particle agglutination here in a micro titer plate. The patient's serum and controls diluted and incubated with unsensitized gel particles or gel particles sensitized with pallidum antigen. A positive test is agglutination smooth mat covering the surface of the well here okay a negative test is no agglutination you get a button so this is uh we do this with a solid phase and blood bank so it's kind of weird to think about but it it kind of flips the scenario on you because you're so used to thinking if the if the pellet is there then that's a positive agglutination right and that's a little different here because this is a solid phase where if the agglutination occurs, it smooths out into the well instead of the bullet, okay? So keep that in mind, but that's another way of testing. Our Eliza, of course, is, hey, we're gonna take a well, we're gonna put uh, anti-human IgG in, we're gonna patient serum with anti-trepanemal antibodies that we're trying to detect. Uh, enzyme label trepidemal antigens then are added and then the substrate is added and it lights up and changes color if everything is there that we're looking for, right? So here again, we put the antibodies to attach the anti-IgGs here to detect the anti-trepidemal antibodies. If they stay there, then the enzyme labeled antigen will attach to them and then the substrate will light it up and we will change colors to blue. Yay, you aren't familiar with this, right? So here's our typical antibody pattern. So as you see, primary syphilis, time of infection, remember we said it could be three weeks, right? Three weeks before we start to see primary show up, right? And you see the level of percentage of patients who test positive. So it takes a while to build up. So at 12 weeks before we see up into the 90 percentile that the patients that have have the antibody that level, right? So the treponemal antibody test, this is directly detecting it with either fluorescent or particle agglutination or ELISA, okay? And then here is our non trepidemal test, our RPR, and what you're seeing is this, this is key, and this answers Heather's question. Would we not just screen them for RPR at that point? They're not gonna test positive in the latent stage. They're asymptomatic, they're not gonna screen positive RPR. The cardiolipin is not being produced because there's no damage to the tissue, okay? The thing we can detect in latent is the antibody against treponema itself. Okay. It's been produced since the infection and it's still at a high enough level that it would be easier to detect. Not that we can't detect it here, but the chances are a whole big difference, right? 100% up here to 20% down here. And that's not something you would test for normally, it's just something that. Yeah, so yeah, it would be hard for me to go with, hey, unless what? Ultrastone. Like we see deformities with syphilis and congenital, but not, you know teeth or the main, and we're not going to get teeth, all right? So probably the RPR screen is the best we got, unless the patient says, I may have had syphilis before, or I've had, you know, a, 
I've had sex partners that have tested. So would you get that out of your patient? I don't know. So it'd be just kind of one of those things. You would hope you would. And then if you did, you could do an antibody screen and it definitely would show. But if you're sick with something, like maybe penicillin anyways, would it not help that case? Or is that not how it works? I think anytime you get penicillin, it would help. But yeah. I think once it gets to that certain stage of latent, mm -hmm. um, would it keep you from going to neuro? Uh, hopefully it would, but you just, you know, 30 years down the line before you go to neurosyphilis. We don't know. So here's the algorithm I talked about with testing, initial screening for RPR. If it's non-reactive, go on about your business. You're negative. If it's reactive, then we have to go into the treponemal test. The treponemal test, if they're reactive, that would say you're positive for syphilis. If you got a reactive to RPR, right? and there was no reactive into looking at the straight treponemal spiral key, maybe a false positive, but you definitely would say negative for syphilis. If this, this that, that was that, you know, confirming, confirming of the result. There you go through the reverse, go the opposite way. I would say you're probably not going to get to do immunoassays at the beginning and then back your way into RPR. We do have uh, molecular testing now for DNA, polymerase chain reaction. It would be great. Patient monitoring, perform non-trepidemal antibody titers. If the treatment was successful, then we see the titer going down. Congenital syphilis perform non trepidemal test on mother and infant at birth, looking for IgM specific trepidemal assays to confirm. So if the baby was born and had, oh my gosh, something's up, something doesn't seem right, something's wrong, um, definitely could run the antibody test at that point. And then if you have neurosyphilis, perform the VDRL or ELISA on the cerebral spinal fluid, because that's what's happening is back, basically. All right, how are we doing? We spent a lot of time, I know, on syphilis, but it's number one. But we did want to spend some time on Lyme disease. We've already introduced for micro, hopefully, and even in intro micro, you've heard of Borrelia burgdorferi, but you say no. Okay. That, so it's transmitted by our ichthyoides tick, our hard body tick, uh, Texas star on the bottom of them usually, right? Uh, main reservoir is the white-footed mouse. So the white-footed mouse is the reservoir host. And then the tick is going to transfer that either to a deer, right, white-tailed deer, or to a human. Okay, so the tick is the vector for transmission. But the white-footed mouse is the reservoir host. This is the main sign for Lyme disease is the erythema migraine it's a target swell i mean a rash looks like a bullseye um, it's localized early dissemination late dissemination with arthritis so there's stages of lyme where it just goes from rash to debilitation i mean you can be debilitated by lyme disease so it's very important that we get treated if we have tick bites and we definitely want to get treated if we test positive for antibody to lyme So we do screening. So we're going to try to do the screening downstairs today um, for antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi, but they may not appear until three to six weeks after tick bite. So it's not one of those like, oh my gosh, we pulled a tick off a guy in the ER and we'd like a Lyme test. We can do that, but is the antibody going to be up to the point of the tick bite, right? So that's really key. So usually, usually it's fever after a tick bite. Okay, so that's usually where the patient comes in. Yes, I'm about, I went deer hunting. I had tick on me. Now, a few couple of weeks later, 10 days later, I'm running fever and it's high fever. Okay, so patient may or may not remember that they pulled a tick off of them. Uh, so you got to make sure you understand that. Um, you can actually find this in the tick. So we can take the tick and, and we can do our staining for the spiral key out of the tick gut. 
and that's how we would detect it in the tick itself. Um, but for confirming tests, this is what you need to know for the board, because they always ask this on a board question, for Lyme disease is confirm it with Western blot. So Western blot is dividing uh, the immunoglobulins into bands, okay? And what we do is for IgM, we see two, uh, two of three characteristic bands means positive, and IgG, five of the 10 characteristic bands. And these are the weights of the bands, these kilodaltons over here. So we look for that. So does anybody wanna say which ones are very, very important? So how do we, so we have this list, right? We have a list of all these. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Okay. So let's look at this and figure this out. This is on 382. Yeah, I think it's on 382. You're correct. Thank you. So what is it? Who are, who are our IgM bands? Which ones do you think those are? Is IgM gonna be heavier or lighter than IgG? Remember that? So here is for a result to be considered positive, the presence of a specific IgM antibody, two of the following bands must be present. It is the 23 kilodalton, so that's not the heaviest of the band, 39 and 41. I don't even see 39 on there. Is that 31 supposed to be 39? It's not a 31. Yeah, I don't. I see 30 to 39, and then over here on the chart, I see 31. And it's the same picture from the book, right? It looks like that would be the 39 to me, but I have to follow up and see if that's right or not. It'd be a good thing for y'all to do. So I think the takeaway here in our closing moments is to know that we need two of the three IgM bands. And again, those are what numbers? 23, 39, and 41, we think, we're gonna double check that 39, see if that's 31 or 39. And then five of the 10 IgG bands are considered positive. Okay, so that's key. That would be a test question I would write. I like that test question. Like how many bands and which bands of IgM for Lyme disease? All right. So to finish up, we have this relapsing fever. It's not caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. It's caused by Borrelia. I think you can make this one a foot more fun one. We're gonna go with Maya or Mayama. Yeah, Mayamoto. I kind of like the moto because that's the commercial I saw about a hundred times. Remember that one? Moto, moto, moto or the. That's a mad guess. Moto? What are we going to go with? Motoy. Maya Motoy? Yeah. Okay. We're going to go with Maya or we're going to go with Mayam Motoy? It sounds the same when you say it all together. Okay, good. All right. That is relapsing fever transmitted again by our Ixoides tick, flu like illness, and a skin rash. And we can test it with the lives or PCR. All right. That's all I've got. So uh, relapsing fever is newly discovered and it may cause the symptoms similar to Lyme disease. So sometimes we'll say, oh my gosh, you have Lyme disease, but you may not have Lyme disease. You may have a similar disease. Keep that in mind. But we're going to find out about the 39 and make sure it's 39, not 31. See which one's right, the book picture or the text itself, or is that just, we should have known, right? All right.
See you downstairs later today. We're going to stop the share. See you later, Zoom, in the meeting.